You're listening to Conversations with Shonda, a podcast and event series hosted by Shonda Smith-Baker. Our guests today discuss untold stories of Minneapolis and the laws and the structures that have shaped the city. He's an award-winning journalist, an author of a new book, and a former host for the Minnesota Public Radio News. That's Tom Weber. Enjoy the show. So I, I imagine that everyone in the city knows you, but we have, <laughs> we have listeners outside of the city. And would you mind just uh, doing an introduction of yourself for us? My name is Tom Weber, and um, I'm a longtime journalist. Um, I was a spent many years, almost 20 years in uh, public radio, and, including here in Minnesota at Minnesota Public Radio as a host. Uh, I left that job a few years ago, and now I'm an author. Uh, and I have a new book that is a history of Minneapolis, and the book is called Minneapolis: An Urban Biography, and it just came out. Congratulations! Thank you. It's yes, exciting. My, my order. My, I ordered my book. Oh, very good. Yeah, I think it'll arrive today. So I obviously will be sending it to you for signature. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. It, it's such an interesting w- moment to of all the things that it's that the pandemic makes different you know hawking a book if you think about it you come out with a book you have to do all these in-person events and do book yeah. signings and stuff like that and we're, we're doing none of those so we'll uh, we'll figure it out though yeah yeah oh that's really interesting so well let's talk about how we're gonna push the book out in a minute but can you uh so minneapolis and urban biography why were you compelled to tell this story right now well it's not it's not that sexy of an answer because it's actually through the Minnesota Historical Society and they have been putting, they're, they're putting together a series. So they're doing, they wanted to do four urban biographies. So they had planned it for Duluth just came out and now Minneapolis. And then next year you're going to have St. Paul, an urban biography and Rochester, an urban biography. So this was really just part of a project that the Historical Society had. They had asked me to write it, but that all happened last year, right? It takes time to write a book and research a book. So most of my 2019 was writing the book. The fact that it came out right now is nothing more than a coincidence. And I don't want to pretend that it is anything more than a coincidence. However, the one thing I would say is that when I got the assignment, I really wanted to make sure, I really wanted to make sure that I wasn't just writing a history that said, this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. I really wanted to connect it to the fact that this is also a community for all of its wonderful facets and for all of its wonderful features is also a community that has, in many cases, the nation's largest disparities and inequities. And that can't just be by accident, right? We can't can't just accidentally have this beautiful city with these lakes and all the parkland and all of this great stuff and then also have these massive disparities and so even from last year when i started writing the book the goal quickly became to tell the history of minneapolis in a way that hopefully informs why we have these disparities today i also would just add you know um you know, honors the experience of, of many people, um, the indigenous, native, mm-hmm. African-American people that were, were here that were impacted um, by those stories. Because I think often, um, you know, you and I have both been at a lot of tables and there's days where I'm like, I think people really believe that there's individual actions mm-hmm. of people of color that have led to this disparity. And um, I think <clears throat> part of how we uh, get to a, a more equitable place and reduce them is actually by understanding all of the elements that mm-hmm. that cause us to arrive here. I agree. I think that it's it's you are absolutely correct. There are so many commissions. I'm sure you've served. How many task force have you served I, on? I think I'm on like six now. <laughs> just as we speak, just presently, you know, there are all of these um, panels that are put together earnestly and with good intentions, but which oftentimes result in us just admiring the problem. And I've always thought that one of the reasons we can't get past admiring the problem is because we didn't come into 
the task force or the commission or whatever, knowing uh, the history of from whence we came. You know, it's I, I, I think back to my radio days and, you know, you're like, OK, we're going to do a show today. We're going to have a big show about race, uh, you know, racial injustice, social inequity, et cetera, et cetera. And you spend, you know, it was an hour long show and you'd spend at least the first 30 minutes just explaining the problem again. Right. And it's the 20th time we've explained the same thing. And um, that's important. I mean, th- obviously, that's why we did it. It's so important. But, you know, I think if there was a, a wider uh, foundation that would allow us to go into these task forces with, OK, we, we, know, <laughs> we know these things that ordinarily we would spend the first five meetings on. So now let's get into the thing. I think that's important. And I mean, I've, I've, you know, as you mentioned, I've been at my share of tables and I think there's times where I sit there and I, and I'm like, oh, that's how you think, this is how you think the problem, you know, mm-hmm. where it started or, or where we're going to go. And um, we all have kind of a different uh, opinion, but I think, I mean, the light bulb maybe just went off for me on some of the things that we've done in terms of um, a practice of bringing the historical context into the room so that there's a deeper understanding because we can't really go into systems change unless you understand the system. That's right. And the history. And that's, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not pretending to offer, this isn't a book of solutions, but it's a book that says, um, this is from whence we came. You know, it's interesting. And I don't, I don't know exactly when this podcast is going to post. So this may, may, this may already be in the, the past tense, but um, we're, you and I are speaking on a Friday and tomorrow, Saturday, there's going to be um, up on Plymouth Avenue there's going to be a group of artists that are painting Black Lives Matter on Plymouth Avenue, which we've seen in cities you know, across the country. And so Minneapolis is going to join the ranks. Well, that's I, I, and, and again, by the time this post, this may already have happened. And that's great. I, I think that's great that that's happening. But oh, my gosh, I'm not even totally sure. And I'm, I, I can't speak for them. I don't know. But I wonder if the organizers who put that event together even realize how much they hit it on the head by picking Plymouth Avenue, specifically Plymouth Avenue, because the history specifically of Plymouth Avenue um, gets into so many of these topics. And, you know, there are plenty of people who remember that Plymouth Avenue is where, you know, the police station sits, where um, we had the protests uh, several years ago now after Jamar Clark um, was killed by police. And so they're like, okay, well, maybe that's why we're going to do it, because that's where the Jamar Clark stuff was. But no, Plymouth Avenue's history goes back decades before that. And, and some of that's in this book, and you, know, you get into it. And so it's really important and interest, it, would be, it would be interesting to know if, if, if even the organizers of such an important thing like this even totally fully understood how crucial it was that they picked that stretch of, of land. Yeah. You know, I bet, I mean, you know, I think it's it's hard to kind of really fully grasp the history, especially when history is not told from, a multi, like, from a, a broader point of view, right? Mm-hmm. Like, that's just not how we hear about our history in this city. Yeah. I'm um, talking to you today um, from my house, two houses off of Plymouth mm. Avenue. There um, it is. I live... Uh, I live about 10 blocks down from where the Jamar Clark homicide happened, the murder happened, the Jamar Clark, mm-hmm. and, and where that protest happened. And I know that people connect uh, the police station that's blocks away from that to what was the way the community center mm-hmm. that was there that mm-hmm. then was replaced by the police station. I think that's an important piece of, of history that I hear repeated often. And then I think the other piece I hear about are the riots that happened in the 60s. What I don't hear about is um, kind of the commercial corridor that existed before the Mm -hmm. riots. I don't hear much about that. Were you able to uncover or can you share a little bit more about that history? Right. Yes. And in addition to Plymouth, you also had what is now Olson Highway on the near north. And this was... um, (laughs) You know, I, I, I struggle to come up with a descriptor that tells it a little wrong. But, you know, this was a it, this was a hub for black commercial um, existence in Minneapolis. And this was um, I think it was Sixth Avenue. Do I have that right. I think it was Sixth Avenue before it was Olson. And it was just a regular 
you know, it was kind of like a Lindale or it was kind of like a Plymouth, right? And it was just chock full of black owned businesses. And this was a hub for, um, you know, black enterprise and just community. And when they just, then they, then they expanded that and made it into a highway. So they had to clear the land to make it a wider highway. And how many times, you know, we, we tell the story so much about I-94 and how it cleared Rondo over in St. Paul, the historically black neighborhood. Well, that's a comparable thing that happened on what became Olson Memorial Highway. Olson is named for Floyd Olson, who was a governor of Minnesota who died in office. Um, and actually, as we talk about naming things, I, I don't think it's improper that we named that highway after him. He was from the north side, you know, like, so we, it, that, that, that in and of itself isn't the issue. It's the fact that when we made it into a highway, we widened it. And when you widen a street that wide, you can't cross it as pedestrians. You can't have this hub. You can't, you know, cheat into the street a little bit because you know traffic's going slower because it's, it's this, uh, it's this hop in place. It was also a place on the music side of things where you had black musicians and artists who could not perform downtown. They would come up to the near north. They would come to these venues that in many cases were secret. You just kind of had to know about them. <laughs> and, you know, you go in, you know, you had all these famous people um, who, were at, who were black performers. When they came to town, that's where they performed. Yeah. The time I also thought or I've, I've uh, thought I knew that there were also a number of uh, Jewish business owners mm -hmm. along the same mm -hmm. corridors. That's right. And, um, you know, I, I often tell people there's white people that have always lived in yeah. North Minneapolis, yeah. right? Like, I mean, even yeah. the majority. And so I graduated from North. My mom graduated from North High School. My grandmother graduated from there. And um, in all of our cases, um, it was a fairly uh, diverse school of, of lots of folks coming in. And I think that's another part is that we stereotype parts of, of our communities. But, um, you know, I, under, I understand it, that there was also a big Jewish sort of community there. Mm -hmm. Is that accurate? From your absolutely. Research? That's absolutely right. And part of that goes into um, one of the goals of the book. And so, yes. Yeah, so in the early 20th century, there were a lot of Jewish immigrants um, in North Minneapolis as well. And, you know, in, in Jewish history, early on in America's tale, there was, um, you know, you, you, you had people from Eastern, you had Jews from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe as well. And, you know, you had different parts of Europe. And, you know, in the early days, they, they didn't necessarily talk a, a ton to each other. The Jewish community, um, really united more with World War II and what was happening, you know, with Hitler and, and, and Nazism and fascism. And the re but, but, but you also have to take a, a step back because there was this moment when no the North side was home to a large, very large Jewish population and a large um, black population. So you're thinking, oh, well, what a coincidence, right? No, it's not a coincidence because in every other part of the city, most other parts of the city, not every part of the city, you had what we know of as redlining, right? You, you had redlining in cities across the country where um, it was very hard um, for black people to buy a house. But in addition, you also had racial covenants, language written into the deeds of the home so that if I bought a home, I signed the papers that said, okay, Tom. When it comes time to sell your house, you can't sell it uh, to a Negro. That was the language used in the in the covenants back then. Initially, it said you can't sell it to a Jewish person, although the religious um, exemption was struck down uh, relatively early. Um, but you couldn't sell houses largely to black people. For a time, though, it was Jewish people as well. And so guess what? People who are marginalized, people who are are told you can't live here can only live in certain areas and there were very distinct areas of the city where black people lived but it wasn't um what's the what's i'm sure you you've heard this about self-segregation it wasn't self-segregation i mean there is there is a sense of community there's something to be said for wanting to be in community and certainly with some of the jewish traditions um that's that's even advocated and required where you actually live physically 
uh, close to one another. But that wasn't happenstance uh, that people ended up in certain parts of the cities because they, they literally could not buy homes in other parts of the city. And do you think as a, a community, and, and I'll just say community because this is consistent with what has happened across the United States, do you think that, that, that our community understands how that decision, how the redlining has created some of the disparities that we're faced with? I don't. I don't. I don't. I, and to be honest with you, I, I'm not sure that the, that the um, sociologists and the scientists and the historians that have actually studied redlining could fully tell you how it has affected, you know, I mean, it's just such a big thing, but no, I mean, day to day, people don't go around thinking, oh, well, I'm in an area that was redlined, or I'm in an area that was the opposite of redlined, so this is where white people live, right? Like, it's just not, you know, it's like, you know, you think about, you grow up and learning what you're learning. You know, we, we just had this big thing a, a month or so ago about Juneteenth, right? June 19th and the importance of Juneteenth. Um, and, and then that happened right around the time of the anniversary of Tulsa. Two events that I can guarantee you, and I grew up in Illinois in the suburbs, but I can absolutely beyond guarantee you that as a, as a, a young white boy in suburban Chicago, never, never, I, I, I maybe knew where Tulsa was, but never learned those things. And so, you know, redlining is going to be part of that. Our, our, how are we teaching it? it is, it's interesting. This is a, a slight tangent. I grew up in a, in a suburb of Chicago. And unlike in Minnesota, the school districts usually match the boundaries of the city. They're the same. But in Illinois, they're kind of all over. And so my community was actually part of two school districts. And the one school district that I went to is where I went to. But the other school district in my community, and I just learned this literally a month ago, the other school district that was that included part of my community was the first school district in the north that was ever told and ordered by a court to desegregate because it hadn't after brown versus board of education this was this was in literally the community where i lived i grew up in this city this uh, suburb of of chicago and i never knew that i never knew that till a month ago yeah yeah, you know, I mean, I, I don't think that this um, phenomenon of not knowing is like kind of only for white people and, mm -hmm. and, and like people of color understand the depth of their own history and can relate it to what's happening today. Uh, you know, there's so many things that, you know, even in school, when I think about kind of the lessons I didn't learn that would have been important for me mm -hmm. to better understand um, that history, not just the things that were um, the obvious points in history, right? Like Martin Luther King and slavery yeah. and those points, but the people that were important um, to that history, particularly the people that looked like me that helped build um, our city um, and the people that influenced um, the people that were the first so I imagine as you were writing this book and through your, your, your history as a journalist, your research, that you have maybe come across some notable folks of color, indigenous people that maybe we are all less familiar with. Can you share any of those, yeah. those folks? You know, the first one that comes to mind actually is, is a woman who probably is decently known, like her name ID is okay but i would argue to your question that you just asked is probably is is absolutely not widely enough known and that's nelly stone johnson who in it's interesting in 1945 um 1945 obviously the year when world war ii ended there was the, if you recall there was this moment there was this moment where the war was over in europe but not yet over in in the, the pacific theater that was a few months there where there was still the war happening um, in the Pacific. And in that time, in the time between the end of the war in Europe and the end of the war in Japan, we actually had an election here in Minneapolis. The, the, the elections for mayor and city offices used to be in the middle of summer, if you can believe that. And so on that day in, um, <clears throat> in the summer of 1945, the thing we think about that election 
the most is that Hubert H. Humphrey was elected mayor that day. But the same, that exact same day is when Nellie, uh, Nellie Stone was elected to the library board, which used to be an elected, <clears throat> which used to be an entity. First of all, it's now all under the auspices of, of the county government. Um, and it had elected officials. And she was the first um, uh, uh, black person and black woman ever elected to any citywide office in Minneapolis. And that happened in 1945. And so you think, oh my gosh, what an achievement. You know, she broke this barrier. But for Nellie, that was like the 10th of 15 major huge things she was going to do in her life. She was a, a union organizer. She helped um, found the NAACP here in Minneapolis. And it's so interesting that we are having our conversations right now about um, statues at the Minnesota Capitol, as you know, because one was recently um, uh, made to fall. Uh, because at the exact same time that happened, there are plans, and, and, and I think it's actually possible this would have already happened if we hadn't had delays from COVID, but Nellie Stone and Johnson is getting a statue at the Minnesota Capitol, and she will be the first uh, African-American, um, I, I definitely the first black woman, but I think the first black person to ever have a statue at the Minnesota Capitol, and that is set to happen yet this year, and, and there might be some delays from, from the pandemic and things like that. But but this is a woman that everyone should know about. Yeah, and, you know, again, just going back to the importance of mm-hmm. seeing yourself reflected in ways that are accurate um, to, to place. And when I think about, I don't know, what flashed before me are all the institutions that I go in that have pictures of all their presidents and all their mayors, mm-hmm. and, you mm-hmm. know, and all their electives. And you go through and, you know, you might find a woman um, but there's usually an absence of, of people of color. And I certainly hope that when people look back at our history um, of our time and our lifetime and the decisions that we could make now in terms of leadership and representation, um, we will uh, begin to see those faces show up and the honoring happen. I agree. Yeah. I agree. So when, when we talk about, um, there's two things that you brought up for me. Maybe I'll go with um, this this idea, and I read uh, a blurb from the book that um, you were talking about on the same day, these, you know, these things are happening. And um, you have a saying in the book about the, I think the whiplash baked into Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. Can you talk more about that? Because we often talk about these, these realities or these, these paths or these multiple paths in which um, our communities are taking, but what is a whiplash? baked into many <laughs> Well, you know, and I, the example I use, and this is how the book starts, is by telling the story that everyone who was alive and following it in 1987 was following the twins, right? The twins won the World Series that year. And that was this amazing, wonderful thing. And everyone had their Homer hankies and all of that. And so they won the World Series on a Sunday night uh, in late Oct- in October of, of 1987. And I'm sure you remember this, but, you know, there were parades. They went oh, to do. the it White the House. First, the first seat, the, the, I skipped school that day. It was major. Oh, you did? <laughs> <laughs> well, and it was major. There were, there was actually a parade in Minneapolis and then one in St. Paul. Like they did a parade in, in a part of Minneapolis, hundreds of thousands of people. Then they went over to St. Paul and they ended at the Capitol and had a big thing there. Another hundred, a couple hundred thousand people. Like it was a huge thing joyous, most wonderful week. You know, this was a wonderful, I mean, it was, it was a wonderful week. The, uh, the, uh, they got to go to the white house, you know, all the stuff. Um, and on the Friday of that week, there was a ceremony. And then on Saturday, there was an, it was like a two day thing. There was a vigil and a ceremony at Fort Snelling state park. Um, which is near Bedote, which is the confluence of the Minnesota and the Mississippi River, right down the hill from Fort Snelling. And there was a ceremony that was marking the installation of a memorial to remember the concentration camp that once existed on that floodplain. So if you've ever been to Fort Snelling, you know that that's at the top of the bluff. And if you go to the bottom of the bluff down by the river, there's this huge floodplain. And right now it's a state park. You've probably maybe ridden your bike back there. You've gone on a hike out to Pike Island. Well, 
on that plot of land in the winter of 1862-1863, uh, hundreds of Dakota women and children mostly were uh, interned there um, in what can really only be described as a concentration camp. Many died from disease like measles, like there was a mini pandemic, uh, if we can use that word in, in 2020, you know. Um, and it was a horrible, horrible chapter in our history. And I, I'm sure you never learned about the concentration camp at Fort Snelling growing up either um, after the U.S.-Dakota War um, out in um, uh, western Minnesota. So on Sunday, we win the World Series and we are jubilant and that is dominating the news conference and on Friday, so that's, you know, arguably one of the most united moments in Minnesota history, one of the most jubilant. And on Friday, we took a time to, we took time to note one of the darkest chapters of Minnesota and Minneapolis history. And I, that, that little ceremony down at Fort Snelling State Park got very little coverage. Nick Coleman did an article, a column for it in the Minneapolis paper, but that was about it. And it was amidst a paper that had 50 pages dedicated to whatever the twins were doing, you know, in the aftermath. So um, I, I, I guarantee nobody knew that that ceremony happened five days after the World Series. In fact, when I was researching the book, one of the guys who had written about that ceremony, when I called him, I pointed that out to him and he had forgotten that he, he didn't remember, you know? And so that's the whiplash. It's the, it's that, that plays out in us being, you know, there's, there's going to be a new ranking that comes out today and we're the, we got the best park system in the country or we got the best, you know, local beer scene or, you know, dog friendly restaurants or all of this and all of these great lists that you want to be at the top of um, in the same month that we get, the latest report about how our disparities, where we are failing um, opportunities for um, students of color in our schools and how the African-American home ownership rate in the Twin Cities is the lowest of any metro in the country. Now, that's home ownership, right? So home ownership, which, as you know, and again, is something people should know, you know, one of the, one of the ways you build wealth and, and pass that wealth on to generations is home ownership. And that has been something that has largely been denied black people for so many ways, in so many ways throughout history, which is, you know, to the, to the initial point you made in the conversation about people think that this is just individual actions that cause these disparities. Well, we, you know, we have set up structures, not just in Minneapolis, by the way, but we have set up structures that have not allowed, that have literally prevented, legally prevented um, black people and other communities of color from um, something like home ownership, yeah. which is a way to build equity and to to build wealth to to pass on to to future generations. Yeah, and so you know, from the earlier conversation we had, when I'm like, you know, what does this have to do with disparity? Well, you have the generation of wealth, you have segregation of the mm -hmm. city, you have you know, the, the concentration of schools that are better supported, like you have all these things that are the consequence of public policy. The, the other question, I, you know, I'm like, I'm pulling out little pieces because, you know, so one of the things that I learned, even in this, that little blurb, or maybe I knew it, I don't think I did, but this 1909 riot in Prospect Park. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, can you tell us what that was? <laughs> Well, it was it was actually um, arguably what what helped um, birth what then became racial covenants to keep black people out uh, of certain areas. So in Prospect Park, which is a very nice, leafy uh, neighborhood, there was there actually had been uh, an African American family that moved in and bought a house um, and. He, the owner, had encouraged a friend of his who he worked with that says, you should come, you know, you should come and live down the block from me. There's a plot. I think they were going to build the house and it wasn't just a matter of buying the house. I can't rem totally remember the exact detail, but it was like, come on, um, you know, we can live in the same neighborhood. And in whatever way, having one black family was passing as acceptable, two was just not enough. Two was just the last straw. And so you had what was described in the newspaper as a race riot where hundreds of people um, marched to the house 
they marched to the house of the first black family that already lived there. And the other family was living there while their house was getting built, right? So that they didn't quite have a house to move into. And they showed up and said, quite literally, in a letter that they read out loud to them, we don't want you here. We don't want you here. And the year before, there was actually a similar incident where a reverend in Linden Hills um, had tried to move in. That was a story where the previous owner of the house was a white person who apparently had gotten into some argument with her neighbors and was so mad at them that she listed her house for sale and put in the sale for sale to Negroes only. Like she was, and, and she was trying to piss off her neighbors. I mean, it was, it was petty and all of that. So the Reverend bought it. And what ended up happening was they were like, oh, no, 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 that, that can't be. And so the Neighborhood Association tried to buy it back from him for more. And in that case, the sheriff found some loophole that allowed him to take it back to, on, to, to cancel the sale. And instead, the, the house got sold to the Neighborhood Association instead of this person. And both of those houses today are worth hundreds of thousands of dollars and never they never got you know, the ownership. So what ended up happening after Prospect Park was that, you know, in the next year or so, you started seeing um, real estate agents start putting this language into their deeds when they would sell the house that said, when upon, so to the new person who just bought this house, upon your selling the house at some point in the future, you can't sell it uh, to black people or initially it was Jewish people and it was other people of color and other, other, other people um, listed in the in the covenant, so Prospect Park was actually arguably what started then a history of covenant. So you actually had it's interesting because there were parts of the city like Southwest, like Linden Hills, where in the late 1800s and early 1900s you actually had a handful of black families living there. But starting in 1910 until about 1950, it all went back down to zero. Because of these covenants, you actually had parts of the, of the city that were overwhelmingly white, but did have a handful of black families, but even they were largely forced out. And what, in, what ended up becoming um, the, 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 tr the tool of the trade, the trick, so to say, was that if it, it was found that a black family was moving in, the local neighborhood association would come in and offer more money and they had just paid for the house. They were so opposed to the idea of black families living there that they that they knew they were going to pay more than they they, they were going to eat the cost. The neighborhood association was going to say, "You just paid ten thousand dollars for the house. We're going to offer you fifteen because we want you gone." Uh, and that was the working practice, and it happened in many parts of of South Minneapolis and Southwest Minneapolis. And so it, you know, the. The thing is, is that we, we didn't have Jim Crow laws. We Progressively on paper, we had all the right anti-discrimination laws for the time that you could imagine. Um, we were a hugely abolitionist state. But in practice, you don't, you don't need a law that says separate water fountains yeah. or sitting in separate parts of the bus to still create discrimination. And so... Racial covenants were written into private contracts. When you sell a house, that's a private contract. The government files the paper, but that's a private agreement. And so that's why they were allowed to exist because, well, if it's a private sale between two people, then they can put any restrictions they want. So we had ways in the North and we had ways in Minneapolis of, of doing exactly what was happening in the South, just separating people, just even if it wasn't through formal laws, although later it did become through formal laws. But initially, it was just like, let's find out daily practices that we can do uh, to separate people. And as, I, as um, you were talking, I was reflecting back to um, watching uh, the Jim Crow of the North. That's right. It's a, great, it's a great documentary through TPT that is available on their website. And if you, know, you have, it's, 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 a, it's a must it's a must watch. And, and, you know, one of the things that, that that documentary showcases that my book also points to is that there is this really important project called Mapping Prejudice that exists. Um, Kirsten Delegard is, is the head of it, and she's in that, that documentary. And what they're doing, and these covenants existed in other communities other than Minneapolis, but, I'm, but 
race um, mapping prejudice is the first large scale project to actually go through all the deeds in Hennepin County and document which properties have these covenants. So there's actually tools where now you can look up your address and mm -hmm. say, you know, you may still live in a house today in Minneapolis that has this language inside your deed. It's not enforceable anymore. It doesn't actually mean anything officially, but um, that language might actually still exist. As, you, as we sit here today, if you are sitting in your house in Minneapolis listening to this conversation, your house might have language in its deed that says you can't sell it to black people. And, and actually in 2019, the legislature passed a bill that sets up a way for you to get rid of that language. Like you can go research your own house, see if you have this language, and then you, there's this now this new way that you can file these, this piece of paper, something, something, and you can actually get that language removed. I mean, China, you you might actually have it in your house for all we know. I, we, I might. You, I, know. <laughs> I might actually. <laughs> Who, for all, for all know, we know. Our, our, the area that I live in in North is, it has an interesting history as well. And um, I think I'm going to do that. And, and, you know, we hosted a conversation at the Minneapolis Foundation for um, donors into our One mm -hmm. Minneapolis Fund, right? It's, a, mm -hmm. it's kind of a response fund that, that hopes to bring and works to bring people together to kind of learn more about this, right? Almost like a, a learning circle that mm -hmm. um, people in, invest um, into one issue and, and we um, attempt to provide some depth, some deeper understanding mm -hmm. of the community. And we watched Jim Crow of the North uh, together. Afterwards, you know, I almost said, shucks, like I kind of missed, missed the mark on that because we probably should have had more time to debrief what people mm -hmm. can do because there was an experience of folks that were in the room that saw their block or saw a house that they lived mm -hmm. in at some point or lived in now. And um, it was jolting for people. And so I think that it's an important thing that we missed in our work and why it's important for us to have these podcasts and discussion because there's a step that people can take if they want to mm -hmm. remedy some of those those past harms is to just simply go look up the deed and then take advantage of mm -hmm. the passing of that law that would allow for you to read that link. Yeah, absolutely. And that that's, you know, and quote unquote, that, that's one of the easier things you can do. There's also things, you know, and this isn't, you know, in the book or anything, but you know, like, you know, and you know this very well, Shonda, and we were talking before we started recording here about how you ran for school board once, but it's like, you know, look at our schools. You know, you, you definitely have some schools in some parts of the city where people are, are well off and that's fine. That's not, I'm, I'm, they're not bad people, but you know, they're better at raising money. They can have the private fundraisers for the school and it, it buys the equipment here, or et cetera, et cetera. And that's, again, all, that, that's not in and of itself a bad thing. But if you're on one of those PTAs or if you're on one of those organizations that's raising money, is it worth it to also bring up in one of these meetings? Well, you know, as while we're raising all this money, why don't we also partner with a school in a community or a neighborhood that doesn't have the same level of resources? And maybe we can, you know, raise money for them, too. I mean, that's just an idea I literally thought of as I'm sitting here on the couch. But I mean, people... If you're looking for ways to to think about this, then then think about it, then yeah. then then really think about it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. And um, so you know, we can't talk about the the history of Minneapolis without talking about um, the presence and history of our Native and Indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. And um, can you say a little bit about how we kind of got our start as a as a Twin Cities? Um, we do that. So, yes, I mean, obviously, as as in any part of the country, we are on indigenous land. And historically, there have been um, many different indigenous peoples through like through like the thousands of years of history from the Ice Age up to, you know, uh, the, the, the up to today. But really, the Dakota people for Minneapolis um are the are the most uh, prominent in that history? Ojibwe people, who um, are are largely um, known today as having an existence, and their tribal reservations are more in northern Minnesota. Ojibwe people also were here, and they were trading partners. There was a lot of trade. You know, the Mississippi River is an important 
part of this history. And the Mississippi River for white people when the United States got started was an important transportation hub to get goods up and down the river. Well, guess what? The same was true uh, for indigenous people. And so this was a place, this was a hub. This was a hub for trade between different indigenous peoples um, around the land. Um, And so you have the Dakota people. And the way that the Twin Cities comes into existence is it actually starts with, so after the, um, 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 when we had the Louisiana Purchase, um, which bought all this land, uh, brought it under the auspices of the United States in 1804, then there were all these expeditions. And so Lewis and Clark got, went out west and this guy named Zebulon Pike went north and he came up the Mississippi River to what became the area around um, Bedote. So Pike comes up um, with marching orders from the general in Louisiana, who was kind of the governor now of whatever this Louisiana purchased land was, sent up to to make relations and make friendships with the native people who were here. Now, now, before this happened, there had been hundreds of years of French and British um, people here in the area as mostly fur traders. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were definitely here, but they, they, and they definitely caused some problems, but they also weren't necessarily here with the overarching goal of saying, while they would made claims that this is French land or this is British land, they didn't really expect to set up anything more than a trading post, right? But after the um, U.S. comes into existence, Minnesota is the West. Like, we're the West, the Western frontier. It's not California. We're the West. And it slowly became <clears throat> clear that, you know, to the to the powers that be in Washington and Philadelphia to say, well, we need to protect ourselves out West. So Pike comes up in 1805 and he gets this gathering of Dakota people, but it wasn't a full gathering of all the Dakota chiefs. It was just a few. And they meet on what became Pike Island, um, which had its own Dakota name, of course, and still does. And he basically set this treaty out that said, we want to have the right to build a fort here. And um, we want you to cede this land, this couple hundred, this hundred thousand or so thousand acres that basically became Minneapolis and St. Paul. We want you to cede this land to the U.S. government. We can we get to build a fort, but you also get to use the land as you have. Like there's like day to day, initially nothing will change. Well, um, he didn't. He left the part with the number amount blank. Um, and only two of the Dakota chiefs signed it. And so it really wasn't, from the Dakota perspective, valid. And, the, and this guy was gone as quickly as he came because he kept going up north to, to do some more exploring. So uh, it's interesting when you think about it that the land that, it, that then, the, side, the, the, the sidebar, I'm getting down a rabbit hole here, but the Pike Treaty that set aside this land that basically became Minneapolis and St. Paul, at the time, you had to be commissioned by the president to do that. And he wasn't. Pike wasn't. He was commissioned by this general in Louisiana, a general who, after he died, by the way, was found to have been a traitor because he was selling secrets to the Spanish. Um, uh, so it is very um, logical to say that the initial treaty with Native people that ceded, quote unquote, ceded land that literally became Minneapolis was an invalid treaty. (laughs) There were actually a couple more. And then you had decades of more treaties and more land being ceded and the government promising we're going to provide you this, that, and the other thing. And um, most, uh, many or most of those promises not being fulfilled. And so, you know, that's where we get to where we are today, where we are on Dakota land. Uh, and, uh, their way of life was just rooted out bit by bit. Yeah. You know, I mean, we hear about the history and it's more, um, broadly known around redlining, 
um, uh, another conversation I had with Dr. Uh, or with Richard Rothstein, who wrote The mm-hmm. Color of Law, that talks yeah. a bit more about this and how it's happened across the country. That's right. Um, you know, and I think, you know, coming from the African-American community, I can say, well, you know, we were redlined to this part of the city and this is how it um, impacted wealth generation for my community. And then you layer into that and those houses were even on Dakota land mm-hmm. and strip wealth, you know, an opportunity mm-hmm. from indigenous people. And, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a tangle um, web yeah. of, of history that, um, it does be it's starting to feel like we're becoming more comfortable with having the conversation around mm-hmm. what happened. Yeah. Which I think is, is essential to um to progress. And so this leads me, I just have a couple more questions um, yeah. for you. But in in your um book or in, in your research, have you were coming um kind of if if I don't even know how to correctly language this to, to honor and respect George Floyd, but we're in this aftermath of um, this this murder of, of a man um, in our city by the police officer. Um, and I'm wondering in, in your um, research, did you uncover things that maybe could lead to where the police community interactions may have been seeded and developed? You mean how it got to here, how it yeah. got, frankly, so bad? Well, you know, there's a long history that <laughs> Too long this, this could have been the whole podcast. But yeah. the short version is this. The short version is this, is that in 1900, we had become mayor, a guy named Doc Ames, who was actually, he, he was kind of the Grover Cleveland of Minneapolis because he served like four terms as mayor, but they were all non-consecutive. Like he became mayor, then he wasn't mayor, then he came back and then he came back. We actually had a few of those in, in our history. This was his fourth time as mayor. And this guy was corrupt as the day is long. And, and on the night of his inauguration, you know, as you know, mayors take office around the first of the year, um, whenever they're uh, after the election that they've had. The day he's inaugurated, they do the ceremony, and that night he fires half the police department so that he can install his cronies, saloon keepers and political allies and all of this. And really what this, the reason he did this was because now the police are going to help him with the organized, uh, with the the gambling and the organized crime that he's going to allow to come into Minneapolis because he's going to get a take. So the police, instead of you know, busting these endeavors would tell the people perpetrating them where to go and what to do and how to do it and give us our cut. And then that cut gets sent up to City Hall. So you have this corruption. But then, as you know, this also, you know, St. Paul gets a lot of the credit for the organized crime area, the gangster area, you know, the Dillinger, John Dillinger. But Minneapolis had plenty. Plenty of that as well. You know, we also had these very arcane liquor laws in Minneapolis for many decades that limited where you could sell liquor. And it was a, it was kind of a redlining of its own. Uh, in, it was a liquor lining, if you, want, if you want to call it that. But what ended up happening was that there were only a few places in the city where you could legally sell alcohol. And what ended up happening is in places like the Gateway District where you could, this then also became the place where you could have prostitution where you could have, you know, commercial sex workers, as we call it today. Back then it was called prostitution. Um, this is where you could have illegal gambling. And this is where the police could walk around and go into all of these bars and saloons and take their cut for turning a blind eye to all that was happening. So that's not new, right? We've had examples of that in other cities throughout the history as well. But then you also had these moments where the police, you know, we have, and this is something we didn't really get into, but it's in the book, but there's a long and really important history of labor law and unions here in, in Minneapolis and trying to break in. We, we were a virulently anti-union town um, for much of the first part of the 20th century because of an organization called the Citizens Alliance that was an anti-union it was kind of the. It was called a union against unions, as the book is called. That that talks about it, and it's it's all of these businesses coming together to say we're just going to keep unions out. And they did a really good job. St. Paul was a massive union town, and Minneapolis was not. So in the 1934 trucker strike, 
which is legit worth its own podcast, you had um, all of the people who wanted to unionize and organize the truck drivers in the, in the city who made deliveries, delivered goods to market. They all wanted to organize and they had this big strike. Well, you had this moment called Bloody Friday where um, two strikers were shot and killed and there was that actually ended up breaking the alliance against unions. But what was happening was that you have the businesses and the strikers on two sides, I mean, physically on two sides, you would think that the police would be the neutral party to keep the peace, but they were actually on the side against the unions. They were charged with helping to bust the unions as well. In 1967, up on Plymouth Avenue, when we had the unrest there, Josie Johnson um, was an aide to the mayor at the time, a civil rights icon, wonderful person. Um, and the the feeling from the community was, if you're going to come up here and sweep the community to to clear people out, um, if you let the police do that, they're going to bust heads in the worst possible way. Which is why the National Guard was called in. Mm-hmm. It was thought it was thought of that the National Guard wouldn't be as you know, wouldn't bust heads the way the police would. They, they, they wanted the, they preferred the National Guard in that moment. And what ended up happening was that the, the then head of the police union, uh, Charlie Stenvig, who is literally in the same position that a guy named Bob Kroll is in today, the head of the police union, um, felt that the police were handcuffed in that moment, that they weren't allowed to do their job. So he ran for mayor two years later and ran on a law and order campaign, which was very well known in the late 60s, Nixon and George Wallace. And he says, if I'm going to run for mayor so we can take the handcuffs off the police. The thing you have to remember is that that's probably not a slogan that would win in Minneapolis today if you ran for mayor. But but back in 1970, 69, we were still a 99% white community. 90%. and Stenvig won that race. Stenvig, the, the guy who was in the job, like the head of the police union became mayor. I don't think that would happen today. I think it's different today. And one of the main reasons is we're no longer a 90% white city. Um, but that did happen in our, in, our, um, in our history. So that's a long answer of a few examples throughout history where the police, you know, that I think that helps explain some of how we got to here with the, the relations that, that we have as a community with, with our police. Yeah, I mean, I think that this has been a great sort of introduction of a number of things that were really coming together, right? The convergence of, you know, the people, the mm-hmm. policy, um, you know, the actions that have led. And it's not like a single thing or a single date or a single person that got us here, but there were mm-hmm. times, right, in a community that was um, not diverse, or at least it was diverse and not diverse, and you know, yeah, yeah. Um, right. But I think, you know, I guess my last question, and then I'll ask um, you to say a little bit more about where folks can, can find your book. Mm-hmm. And um, but one of the questions that I consistently ask uh, folks on the podcast is. You know, in our um, work in philanthropy, I guess my question in this case would be, what role does philanthropy have in supporting the telling of the history of um, of our city, or or is there a role for us to do that? Mm. Well, you know, there's there's um, that's really a I'm sure that's a thing you think about every day in your role at the foundation. Um, I mean, the answer is obviously yes, right? It should be part of this. I think that, um, you know, there, there's, there's definitely uh, examples of foundations and philanthropy coming in and saying, well, we think we know what the answer is. And so here's some money yeah. <laughs> and go do it. And it makes me wonder just in your asking that question, if they've done the work ahead of time to learn the research, you know, there's, there's efforts like the one read where everybody in the city, you know, reads the same book and, you know, they have a conversation and I'm not, I'm not unfairly advocating that my book do that or anything like that. I, I don't, those are very 
nice and good and good efforts that we should have. But yeah. there also, I think, is is the mindset, and I'm sure you've run into this, where we have to check ourselves, especially if we're in philanthropy, and asking, are we coming in to say, here's some money for the solution we think will work, or are we, or or are we coming in and saying, well, we want to fix this problem, but we want the community to lead that. And so a lot of that has to be explaining the history uh, yeah. of how we got to here. And so it's uh, it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about when I was a radio host and I try to do these, these shows about racial justice or, or racism. And you spend the first half hour just getting us back to zero just to yeah. catch people up. You know, there's probably a little bit of that that's needed in philanthropy to say that, you know, we're tackling big problems. Minneapolis Foundation, you know, is not trying to do small ball kind of work here. But, but of course, I understand why people say, gosh, we have thrown so much money at the schools through all these years. Like, why hasn't it gotten better? Like, I, like, I get. I get the, the the guttural instinct that that gets people to ask that question. I think it's a fair question, but I think that it's so much more complicated. And if you're asking that question, but you haven't studied the history, um, then that's part of the problem too. Yeah, so actually, I think it's a completely legit question to ask. I think that the examination of the response. You know, if what you're thinking is because, you know, it's parents or kids that don't value education mm-hmm. or something that's simplistic, right. I think right. you have more to examine, you know, and, and I think, you know, in asking that question, I, it is also a good sort of um, reflection point for myself in saying, you know, this to me is why it's important to invest in history and, and the history telling mm-hmm. um, in a school setting, right? That um, a curriculum that's inclusive and reflective so that our students know of the Nellie Stone Johnsons and the contributors of, of people to our city. You know, how do, how do we do this, the, that better? How do we support the storytellers and the artists and the researchers in a different way? Because yeah. I think that there's such a, a desire for every dollar to go to kids or to families. And I understand that instinct, but just as complex as it has been, um, and, and actions to get us here, I think the solutions will have to met, match in some ways that complexity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, about, could, could, yeah. I was just going to say, could, could mapping prejudice, for example, be something that gets thrown and, and incorporated into all the schools? I don't know. I, I'm, I, I literally don't know the answer to that, but I don't know. Maybe Pretty that's a good idea, though. Yeah. You know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So the book, so it came out on June. First ish, yeah, June, early June. <laughs> yeah. So here we are in COVID with the podcast we went yeah. in downtown doing, but we're in our homes and your book, uh, an author that would be out on tour. And um, and so I guess you're probably doing a series of of Zooms. <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, we had a we had a we had a launch event and it was all on Zoom. And so I've done a couple things like this, you know, where a couple interviews and things like that on the phone or on Zoom. And but you know, the the truth is is that bookstores are are um, figuring out how to reopen. A lot of them are doing curbside. A lot of the local bookstores are actually, if they weren't already doing it, have now gotten them themselves up to where they can do online sales and things like that. So it's really a, a matter of your favorite local bookstore. Uh, probably has it or can get it. So that, that part's easy. Um, uh, it, it, I actually think bookstores, you know, for all the challenges they face, oh my gosh, you know, when you reopen, how do you open? I think they've been doing some pretty creative things and yeah. trying to keep in touch with their communities and their customers. Yeah, that's good to know. And if, and if anyone listening wanted to have you come and talk to an audience about, about your book and your learning, mm-hmm. how would they um, get in touch with you? <laughs> Well, probably the best way would be if you're on Twitter. Um, my uh, handle is Weber Tom One, and Weber is spelled with one B, W E B E R Tom, and then the number one. You could just at me, and we can get it set up. I also have a. Um, you can also look me up on Facebook and send me a message uh, that way. Um, and then if you're if you're so inclined and you you do the homework, you know this is a book through the Minnesota Historical Society. 
Um, and it's actually the Minnesota Historical Society Press. So if you contacted them and say, hey, you know, like they would know how to they would know how to get a hold of me as well. That's fantastic. Yeah. Is there um, anything, Tom, that um, we haven't discussed that you wanted to make sure it was in this conversation? No, I think I think there's a lot there's a lot of other stories in the book that 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 color in around the edges on what we were just talking about. And so there's I think there's some interesting stories in there. I hope I hope I've told a few stories that people didn't know or widely know um, so that you could just learn a little bit more about about this and that. Maybe, you know, what I, got, I do have one more question, and that is what, you know, did anything surprise you in your writing? Well, you know, it's in the, actually the thing that surprised me the most has actually nothing to do with what we were talking about. It has to do with literally the rocks under our feet, the, the geology of the area. And that is, you know, the only reason Minneapolis exists is because there's the waterfalls, St. Anthony Falls. Like that is like there's no reason to put a city there if there's no falls there. Like, I'm, and, I'm, and frankly, you know, there aren't... A, you know, indigenous people still would have lived here before the, the white man came, but um, those waterfalls were important. They were sacred to the indigenous people, and they were, frankly, economically sacred uh, to the white people who came in. So literally no reason to have a Minneapolis if you don't have those waterfalls. And it's the only waterfall on the Mississippi River. But geologically speaking, 10,000 years ago, those waterfalls used to be in St. Paul. They <laughs> and the, and they were huge. Like if you've ever been to Niagara Falls, yeah, you, there's actually three waterfalls at Niagara Falls, and the biggest of those falls is called Horseshoe Falls. And the falls that exist today in downtown Minneapolis used to be ten thousand, twelve thousand years ago. They used to be where, frankly, downtown St. Paul is, and they were as big as Horseshoe Falls. It was a massive wow. Niagara-like waterfall. And what happened is that there's um, there's uh, the bottom of the river, like there's this fine material, like we have the sandstone and limestone, and it just gets chipped away at. Waterfalls are largely continually being chipped at. Waterfalls are always geologically kind of eroding because the water's coming over and it's bouncing back and it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's hitting all the rocks and stuff like that. And we just had softer rocks. And so geologically speaking, these waterfalls just spent 10,000 years backing up uh, to where they are today. So that was, it was just literally nothing to do with what we were talking about the rest of the conversation, but that was yeah. the thing I found most fascinating. Wow. Um, so is, is it still chipping away and will it be here? That's, be that, here? that's a whole chapter in the book. It's not chipping away because we have come in and we've basically made those falls, you know, part man, part machine kind of a thing. Like, like as much, every part of the falls you see when you're walking across the stone arch bridge, Everything you're seeing is artificial. There are still natural falls underneath the the apron that's there, but we have basically set it in place. We have we have stopped nature literally and kept the falls where they are through man-made means. Wow. So this is where our tea would jump in and have like a thousand questions. <laughs> and I'm just catching up to what I just heard. Um, yeah. This would be completely his, his thing. So yeah. um, you're right. That could be a whole conversation around, around kind of our natural resources and how we, mm-hmm. how they evolved, how we need to protect um, That's right. all of those types of things. But Tom, you know, I just want to just um, say thank you for uh, taking time in the project. I'm so glad they asked you to participate um, in the telling of, of our, our urban city, the mm-hmm. evolution of it. I don't even know what to think about St. Paul being downtown. I guess I'll have to follow up <laughs> on that or for sure read the book. Hopefully it'll come today. But, you know, I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It's been great to be here. Thanks. Yeah. That's Tom Weber and Shonda Smith Baker. Follow Tom on Twitter at Weber Tom the Number One. You can find his book at your local stores called Minneapolis An Urban Biography. To listen to more episodes and learn more about upcoming events, please visit conversationswithshonda.org. You can also follow Shonda on Twitter at Shonda S. Baker. This is Sue Pak Keenitz from the Minneapolis Foundation. Thank you for listening to Conversations with Shonda.